Amen. How's it going, Salt? Doing good tonight? Good stuff. My name's Ryan. Happy to be here. Um, that song is such a good song, Galt. The gyra. Like, do you guys know what gyra means? Like, God, our provider. Um, what do you want God to provide for you tonight? Have you, did you guys think about that coming in? Um, what if God could bend to you right now and ask you that question, what do you want me to do for you? How would you answer that right now? I want you to think about that. Would you, do you need some comfort tonight? Um, do you need some joy tonight? You need some wind in your sails? Um, some healing in some relationships? Uh, I would just encourage you guys. God is here. He wants to bless you. He wants to make much of his glory in his name. And so I'm excited to see what he has for us tonight. Um, let's start off. I'm just going to ask you a question. Uh, just going to ask you a question to get things going. Are you ever tempted to think something or feel something like this? Um, I want to be a Christian, but I sure hope it doesn't change every part of my life. Like, I want to be a Christian. I, I like the whole Jesus persona type of thing. Um, but I'd like to keep my distance, if I'm being honest, a little bit, right? Like, it's, it's cool to see God maybe do some work in me this past year. Um, but I don't really know how I feel about being vocal about my faith, right? Like, I kind of just want to keep the work God is doing a, a little bit private, right? Maybe, maybe you felt something like that. Um, maybe you... I've been really, really good about coming Thursday nights. And you're like, yeah, I like my commitment to Thursday nights. And maybe if I'm on a really good week, I'll go to my connection group. But I don't know if I want God to kind of invade or take over my weekends, right? Like I've got a bit of a rhythm. I got a bit of a reputation to uphold on the weekends. I kind of want to keep God and that separate. Um, maybe it's something else for you. Um, maybe you're just getting into the Bible and you're like, this is cool. But man, there are some things that I really am not so sure about. Um, feels like God is kind of pushing back on maybe the way I previously thought. And I don't know, can I be a Christian and just kind of like not accept some of the stuff that God is telling me? It, if we're being honest, it, it's almost like we, we think of God. Uh, we just want him to be like, like a parent who has a really big open wallet for us, right? Like maybe you guys remember that parent growing up where you and your friends would just go and this parent would just fund anything fun that you wanted to do, right? Like, you know whose mom to go to and she would just dish out the cash and you would go have a lot of fun um, and you kind of like want to treat God like that just like to fund your adventures in life. Um, but in reality, when you probably think of God, you actually think of more of as like that awkward parent who is the, uh, like the chaperone at the high school dance, um, you guys know the moment when you're just getting down on the dance floor and you're just so sweaty, you're hardly recognizable and it's just you and your people out there and you're making memories that will last a lifetime and the music's bumping and you're kind of in the mosh and you look up and you just make eye contact with like your friend's dad. Do you guys ever have that happen to you? Your friend's awkward dad? God forbid it was like your dad or something. Um, that's kind of like what a lot of us think of God. Like yeah, no, you're great, but if you could just stay a safe distance away and not kind of ruin the party, if you could just not kind of ruin what I have going for me, that would be great, God. Um, but here's a problem with that view of God. The problem is every single thing that we've seen in Colossians so far. <laughs> uh, we've been going through this series in Colossians, and um, we haven't just been called to a new hobby in this book or a new social sector, but a whole, brand new life, a whole new life. Um, even the past few weeks, even just like being in Colossians 3, uh, the old you, if you're a Christian, the old you is dead and gone, right? Like you are brand new. Your life is like hidden in Christ with God. Like you have a new life that will be appearing in glory one day. And so you turn now, like Colossians 3 says, and you put to death that old way of life and you put on the new way of life. This is all encompassing stuff. We don't just get to pick and choose where God is dropped in to this new life, do we? This new life with God, he's intimately involved in everything it would appear. And that can be kind of daunting. And so, I don't know, maybe if you prefer God staying at a distance, tonight could be a little bit of a shock because he actually wants to get even one step closer, I think. Um, we're not just talking about the heavenly realm. We're not just talking about spiritual things. This is really, really practical Bible. God is knocking on the door of your house and he's letting himself in. 
Jesus is walking into your house and he might um, actually want to rearrange a few things. Um, like when I bought my house, I remember feeling really, really good about it. And then my mom came and rearranged my entire kitchen and said, this is not how a kitchen is supposed to function, bud. None of this makes any sense. And guess what? It kind of hurt my feelings a little bit, but she was right. And God is going to come into our house tonight, into your house, into your life, and he might want to set some things right that maybe you thought differently. And ultimately, he wants to talk about his vision for our lives, literally regarding our home, right? Um, specifically the relationships between husband and wife, kids and parents, employees and boss. Why does he want to do that? Because guys, our freedom, our thriving and our flourishing all depend on God's presence being with us. Okay, and so I'm just gonna simply ask him the question tonight as we get back into the end of Colossians 3, like what practically happens when Jesus gets involved in your life? Like all the way, boots on the ground, heads out of the clouds, what practically happens when Jesus gets involved in your life? So... Colossians 3, starting in verse 18. If you want to turn there, if not, the verses will be on the screen for you. We're going to read 18 through 4, 1. This is God's word to us tonight. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart, as something done for the Lord and not for people. Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Masters, Deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Paul comes out a little spicy, and he drops the S word, right? Right away, we get submit. Tonight, in God's word, he wants to bring up roles. Okay, roles. Um, there's nothing wrong with the idea of roles in life in general. We all agree with that. Ask any football team, ask any musician that is a part of an orchestra or a band. We all agree that roles have their place in life. Specific roles, specific giftings, all of that stuff. Well, the problem, I think, is not that we don't agree with roles. It's that we're obsessed with our autonomy and we don't want people to tell us what to do. That's the culture we live in. That's the air we breathe. That's the water we drink. The issue when we hear things like women submit, men uh, lead with sacrificial love, um, guys, it's that when we hear that, we start to assume these are value statements about us. We, we start to assume that the way we get value in this life is from our roles. But that's not what's going on here. Let me start by reassuring you guys something really, really, really important. In God's eyes, men and women are identical in value. But that does not necessarily mean that they are identical in role, as we see here. Identical in value, but that does not mean necessarily that they are identical in role. Actually, they are different. And the value that we need, guys, like the value that you were created to receive from something outside of yourself, right? That thing that makes you feel whole that you can't seem to just get on your own, the affirmation, it's not achieved in our job title, in the prestige that you gather for yourself, or just like anything else that you can find in the world. It's not, it's not actually from there. For the Christian, our value comes from God himself. Our, Christian, our, our value comes from God for the Christian who created us, men and women, differently, but equally, on purpose, Okay. Right? The idea of women being submissive helpers, as we say here, and men leading in love, those actually aren't bad things, believe it or not. And stick with me on that. They're not actually bad things. In fact, God made us that way on purpose, and you can see it all the way back on page one of your Bible. Right? Like when we go all the way back to the garden narrative, the creation narrative, the stuff that we think is so old it doesn't really matter. Well, I think even in today's day and age, and especially tonight, it is immensely important, and it matters a lot. And so here's what happens. God creates. And he creates man. He creates Adam. He blesses him. He gifts him an entire world, 
horizon to horizon of blessing and garden and trees and food to eat. And he says, just go nuts, have a ton of fun, um, take care of all this. And he just has one charge, right? Like just don't eat of the one tree in the midst of the garden. Um, that's not for you. But horizon to horizon of blessing, everything else is for you to enjoy. Go have fun. He charges Adam with that very serious and very fun charge. Um, and after the big church, he brings Adam definitely his best gift yet. Don't just enjoy this alone. I'm bringing you a helper suitable fit for you, somebody to enjoy it with you. He brings him a wife, right? He creates woman. He creates Eve, the greatest gift by far. And before the happily ever after and the marriage bells ring and all that could ever actually get started, the villain comes on the scene. You've heard it before. The villain comes on the scene and what he does is really interesting. He attacks directly at God's original design. He doesn't go to the man who received God's words, God's commands. He doesn't go to him to try and debunk him. He goes to Eve. He goes to the woman twisting the words that her leader, Adam, failed to communicate to her. God entrusted Adam with his charge to communicate to his bride and his bride, Eve, was deceived. Genesis 3, 6. I'm going to put this on there. Um, after being deceived, it says that she took some of its fruit and ate it, the forbidden fruit. She, she also gave some to her husband, who was with her. Underline that, who was with her, and he ate it. And then just a few verses later in verse 9, it says, So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? Okay, Eve was deceived, and the man sat next to her as he watched sin and death enter the world. And who does God hold responsible he goes straight for the leader and he says, where are you? He goes after Adam first. And now back in Colossians 3, um, we now are charged to believe that God's original design is for our flourishing. That's what we're charged to believe. We're to fight the women's propensity to lead out over the man and, and instead come back under the man in support in marriage, we're to fight for the man's propensity to passively follow and to get back onto God's original path for blessing that he promised them. And so let me unpack these roles a little bit because uh, he calls the woman to submit, the big S word, I know, and it doesn't sit well in our ears. It doesn't like feel good necessarily, um, but that's not on the word. I think that's just on us a little bit and potentially us for not doing a good enough job uh, maybe explaining this high and noble calling. Right back in Genesis, he's called to be a helper. That, that's what the woman was created to be for Adam. He couldn't fulfill his duty in the world alone. He needed a helper. And where our culture has twisted those words of like submit and helper into like a less than synonym, God's word doesn't do that. That's not a less than role in God's word. In the Bible, God the Father himself is called our helper in a time of need. Psalm 46. I love how Jake Keach and Cedar Rapids talks about it. It's like, have you ever thought about a helper as a hero? Like, that's what we're talking about here. Like, I need help. Here comes your hero. God the Father himself describes himself as a helper. The Bible also talks about Jesus the Son. He's not afraid to come under and submit to his father. Philippians 2, 5, and 7. I'm going to put that on the screen as well for you. It says, adopt the same attitude. This is a command to all of us now. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited or like something he had. He didn't, he didn't hold on. He let go of it. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. And so if you hear these things and you still think that this calling of helper is still of lesser value, then I think you've just misunderstood the scripture. We hear the word submit in the world, like, and we hear, we just like picture like a man yelling at his dog, something like that, like submit to me, it's like lording it over like a pet. But when we see it in the Bible, we see God himself acting out in power and glory. We see Paul's kind of shorthand reasoning as to why, right? Like Colossians 3 is a mirror of Ephesians 5, that gives a little more explanation, but his shorthand here, why do we do that? Why do the women do that? Well, it says, as it's fitting in the Lord. And that does not mean that your husband is God. If you ladies get married, your husband is not supposed to take the place of God in your life. Thank goodness for that, right? 
No guy could be that, and you do not want to marry a guy who believes that. Um, you do not obey him no matter what. If he is leading you to sin, that is not the case at all. Um, and it's just not only that humans were created with roles for their own flourishing, we see. We're talking about this being something that is to be done in the Lord. It's not just for our own personal flourishing. It's not just for our own marital flourishing. This is for the world to see Jesus. We are supposed to be a picture in our marriage to show Jesus, right? Wives take their cues from Jesus himself, who, like we just read, emptied himself for the sake of others. And when women take that attitude, that heart posture of Jesus Christ, the home thrives and the world notices. And guys, what that means is that our roles, even our gender roles, as we're talking about them here, in a marriage that we might have one day, like, they're bigger than even us. It's bigger than you. It's, this is for God's glory. And that's how he designed it. And next, which I know this is a lot, but we see the charge to men, right? And he sees that charge to love. In Ephesians 5, we see as like, be a leader who loves. You are to be a loving leader. And some of you are like, well, that sounds kind of easier than the ladies. Like, that doesn't sound controversial at all. Like, nobody's squirming in their seat right now about that one. Just wait, okay? You, you think you're getting comfortable. Um, you think that sounds easier. Well, let me ask you this. What is God's design for male headship? What is it? Do you know what it is? Well, in Ephesians 5.25, I'll put this on the screen as well. It says, husbands, love your wives. Easy enough. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. How did Christ do that? God's design for male headship is a design of self-denial and death. Yes, death to self. That's what it's talking about. To put yourself not first anymore. The example men are called to is the same Jesus who died for his bride, the church. Men are free in this design, free from their apathy, free from their selfishness. They are free to love someone like Christ loves someone. That's amazing. An amazing challenge, a high calling for life. And all in all, what the world calls constricting these ideas of roles, what the world calls constricting from God's vantage point, from his throne, we see freedom. What practically happens when Jesus gets involved in your life is a question. And the first thing we see is that you enjoy the freedom that his order brings. You enjoy the freedom that his order brings. He is a God of order. And my question for you is, do you know about Jesus and his love for his bride? This wouldn't make any sense, in my opinion, really, it wouldn't make much sense, at least, if you didn't know that. If you didn't know that narrative and that story, I really don't think it makes much sense outside of that. Uh, this theologian wrote about this. This woman theologian talks about God's plan for saving sinners like this. Okay, I'm going to read what she wrote. She said, The command to submit makes zero sense without the background drama it illustrates. It's not like the marriage design was created and then God said, Oh, crazy. That looks a bit like Christ's relationship with the church. A marriage was created and designed for the very purpose of illustrating the cosmic story of redemption. To help the world understand the intimacy of the gospel. The church is safest when she's submitting to Christ. The woman is safest when she's submitting to God's design. I love knowing my role in this illustration. Clarity is freeing. But I'm empowered in my role when I discover that Christ played the role I'm called to play, the one in submission. Guys and ladies, are you a part of Christ's bride, his church? Are you a Christian? It is the safest and most joyful place to be. And I know some of this guys tonight, I even heard some people kind of looked ahead and were like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous for tonight. Don't be nervous. But I know some of this feels bold, and let me just kind of gently ask you a question in the midst of all this. Like, what would it look like for our obedience to come before our feelings? Like, what would it look like for us to actually, no matter how we feel about it, like, submit ourselves under God's word, even tonight? Like, ladies, let me talk to you. Like, could you ever see yourself, just dream with me for a little bit. Um, could you ever see yourself being a supportive hero to a guy who loves you in an Ephesians 5 sacrificial loving type of way? Absolutely. I would hope. Absolutely. Like, 
Who doesn't want to come under sacrificial love? Like, get this, you might be more gifted than him, the person that you marry one day. You might be more gifted and talented than any single guy in this room, but by God's spirit living in you, you can still have the heart of the hero on the cross. God's spirit is in you. You can do that. Do you know what the word submit? You know, like in this original context, it was mostly used as a military term. If anybody tells you that you need to be weak and submit, they have flipped the entire thing on its head and have completely missed the mark. This requires a strong, very, very strong, secure woman to be able to fulfill this role. Who are you following? I want to ask you that, girls. Who are you following? Who are you following on your phone? Who are you beholding? Because you're becoming what you're beholding, right? Like that's why it's so, it's literally so good to read the Bible. But man, our phones are really, we're beholding a lot of stuff on there. And I just want to ask, who are you following? Who are you becoming like? And I won't, don't spend a lot of time on this, but I would just say, don't aim at beauty, aim at wisdom. That would be my charge for the young ladies here. Your calling is going to take courage but it will be blessed all the more. And guys, I want to talk to you too. Um, could you, just dream with me here, could you ever see yourself laying down your life for a woman who has a Philippians 2 heart? I sure hope you could. You might, let's be real, you might be the most insecure average leader ever. <laughs> you might be the most unimpressive, insecure guy that you know, um, but there's no more excuses not to lead. That's what Adam did in the garden. God said, where are you at? I said, what happened? And he said, my wife, it's her fault. No, no more. You have the spirit of God in you and that gives you power and that gives you courage. And so hear me, <laughs> hear me say this also. Stop trying to get girls' attentions with your muscles and your money. Two things that every guy wants more of. Stop trying to get their attention with that. Because the girl that you actually want to marry, the woman that you actually want to marry one day will not care about those things. She will care about your character. And that matters. Man up. <laughs> but man up like Christ. That's what I wrote here. Serve, serve, and serve some more. Be a servant. Do you ever wonder why you feel so empty when you are stuck in cycles of porn? It's because you're doing nothing but loving yourself and that's not what you're called to do. You're called to sacrificially love others. Don't sit around waiting for the perfect girl who just lets you watch Red Zone for 12 straight hours every single Sunday. That's empty. Be the type of man that cares deeply for others who is rooted in God's word. No transition, hard turn, next part of the sermon Paul moves on to parent-kid relationships, okay? <laughs> Verse 20 and 21 say, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. I know you guys aren't really kids, okay? Kinda. It's confusing, I know. You're in a weird in-between stage, and most of you guys are not parents. So what does this have to do with you? I think college is a really, really, really cool time for you to be kind of reflective, to take inventory of your life. Where are you going in the future, but also where have you come from? Um, I think you need to do that. And I don't want to over-explain these verses necessarily, but I do want to say one thing. I know there is a lot of people in here who had a really, really hard life with their parents. I just want to address that. Um, the pressure that they put on you that crushed you when you couldn't perform for them, the expectations of beauty that you could never live up to, maybe as a sibling you couldn't live up to, um, the harsh words that you kind of maybe still hear and still kind of sting a little bit when I say that. This was a lot of your experiences. You didn't see this plan of God's marriage ideal, like you didn't see that played out in your life at your home. And honestly, if you're saying the rest of this, you're like, well, I, you didn't obey that great either. There's brokenness all over your home. And why should you? Imperfect parents, imperfect you, who, imperfect you, who really cares? I'm saying, well, maybe God cares, according to this. Maybe God, maybe God cares. And guys, you see the word tonight, it, what we see here, it doesn't just like give us a license to just be obedient and submissive to our parents when we feel like it. Um, but it gives us a different motivation altogether. 
Our motivation is for the Lord. The Lord who is our perfect father. What practically happens when Jesus gets involved in your life, guys, is that you can live to please your perfect father who loves you. You can live to please your perfect father who loves you. And like, do you, do you know what God is like as a father? Like, maybe you just heard that phrase up, but you don't actually know what God is like as a father. Like, he's the prodigal son's dad. The story where the, the dude just goes out, gives his dad the middle finger, takes all of his money, goes and lives lavishly, hates him, spits on his face, rubs his name through the dirt, every single thing you could do to betray him. And this is still the dad who sits up waiting for you to come home. And when you do, he doesn't just give you the cold shoulder, but runs out to meet you and tackles you and smothers you in affection. That's what kind of dad God is like. If you're a Christian, this God that I'm describing is your father. You are his son. You are his daughter. Every longing that you've had in your life just to hear like, I'm proud of you, son. That you're still waiting to hear. Maybe that has a purpose. Every like hug or like act of affection that you've never actually received from home. Maybe it actually has a purpose. The purpose is pointing you right to God right now. Your longings are not an accident. They're put there on purpose. They're not missed. God is here and he wants to love you tonight. Practically speaking, I wonder if there's some of you guys who have come to college and have come to Christ and have fallen in love with the Lord and you're looking at this and you actually might need to forgive your parents for something. Or you might need to ask forgiveness from your parents for something or another. I'm not saying they deserve it. Nobody actually ever does. I'm saying we aim to please the Lord. Keeping with the hard transitions, our final piece tonight. Going on to the next verses, we're talking about slaves and masters. Just when you thought you couldn't get any more uncomfortable, right? Employees and bosses. This is what verse 22 through 4, 1 says, and I promise it will not be uncomfortable for long. He says this, Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward. Circle this whole verse. You will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. Wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he's done, and there is no favoritism. And finally, masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. What's going on here? Well, guys, let me just take the tension out of the room a little bit. We're not talking about American, Southern, old school slavery here, okay? Um, Paul is addressing the home, right? Like we see that even in our heading, like God is talking about the home. And these homes, um, they had a lot of people in them, not just family, not just your kids and your spouse, but like people who worked in your home, like household servants. And what most homes had had these people there, these servants that, um, yes, they weren't free people. They, they owned the rights to these people. They were enslaved. Um, and plenty of slavery, I'd also want to say, I'm not making light of it, plenty of slavery was brutal in this time. I'm, I'm not making light of slavery. I'm not condoning any of that. Um, but this is more like a paid employee. It's not a perfect parallel, but the closest thing that we can actually think to it in our culture today is more of just like a boss and his employees. Okay, and so when Paul is saying that, this principle, it's like students to professors, children to parents, employees and and bosses, he has something to say to these servants in this role. Revolt and run away? No, he doesn't say that. Submit, obey. When your boss is cool? No, in everything. Okay, the new life that we have in Christ, it liberates us to do something pretty stinking wild, guys. And this really, really speaks to all of us, okay? Pretty wild. We can be the hardest working people and the most carefree people ever. How is that possible? It's because we know from this, we know in Christ that we are not actually in the end working for our bosses or our professors anyway. We are working for God. We are working for the Lord. And because of that, we don't work for the approval of others or to impress them. And we don't only work hard when someone is looking. God is always looking, right? Because we love him. And more importantly, because he loves us, we 
grind and we do it with a smile on our face? What practically happens when Jesus gets involved in your life? Well, guys, just imagine this. You are free from the exhausting pursuit of people-pleasing. You are free from people-pleasing. And guys, I have been to the, I have been behind enemy lines with the people-pleasing capital of the world. I used to work at Chick-fil-A and in high school. And I'm telling you, 90%, did anybody else work here? I don't want to call anybody out. I'm so sorry. But like, 90, besides you, the other 90% of the workers at Chick-fil-A, the whole my pleasure thing is a phony, fake facade. I promise you that. Just kidding. Maybe just the people I worked with. Um, the idea that you should put on a face to make people like you, um, it might make sense when you're selling chicken, but what an exhausting pattern. What an exhausting way of life that is, isn't it? Just to live so people will like you. Just to live to be impressive. Guys, I don't really regret, if I'm being honest, my bad attitude at Chick-fil-A, uh, working there nearly as much as I regretted my apathy as a student at the University of Iowa, in all honesty. I would genuinely challenge you guys to think about your life as a student while you still have it, while you're still a student, and think about if you were representing Jesus at school and at work with your attitude and with your work ethic. Not if you're treated well, but even if you are treated poorly and they don't act like verse one of chapter four, we still work hard and we still work with the attitude of Christ by the help of his spirit. And friends, let me just ask, how in the world are we gonna do this stuff? That is a lot of really heavy Bible from God's word. How do we submit to one another? In marriages, families, work, school, how do we actually pull this off? That's how I kind of feel in the end. Like, how are we actually doing this? I'm going to tell you, it's actually really, really simple. God is not the awkward dad who is chaperoning your dance, trying to get in on everything, be overbearing, and ruin all the fun. God is a lavish, gift-giving father king, and he has something waiting for you. I told you, circle verse 24. It makes our mouths water for the glory to come. We work and we submit to one another knowing that we will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. Knowing the end, guys, actually makes it possible to endure in the moment. And it doesn't just make it possible to endure, it makes it enjoyable to endure. To wives, husbands, kids, parents, bosses, and even people treated like property, God has this inheritance of a son waiting for you, eternal life and glory with him. Where no matter how you performed for him in this life, guys, hear me say this, if nothing else, no matter how you performed in your life for him, no matter how many times you think you let God down, his love remains the exact same for you and it is right there for you tonight. And no matter how hard it may be to obey when our feelings aren't quite matching, we look to Jesus on the cross who obeyed to the point of death. And we see that he is bringing us home by his blood to life eternal, full of joy and full of celebration with him. We look to Jesus, guys. That's where we go from here. So I wanna pray for us. I want us to worship and respond to this good word from the Lord and go out of this place with joy. So Lord, thank you that we are safe under the word of God, that we submit there first and foremost. That God, we know you are looking out for us. You love us. You cherish us. You lavish your love upon us. You give us gifts. You have an inheritance and a reward waiting for us, God, that I know for one, I do not deserve. I know nobody else here believes they do either, God, but we are receiving the inheritance of Jesus Christ himself. God, if there's anybody here that just feels convicted tonight, um, would we just trade together? Would we just reach out, reach our arms outside and just trade our sin, our disbelief, our shame, our embarrassment, whatever it is, would we trade that for this inheritance? A trade that you are faithful to keep every single time. So Lord, would you let us leave this place, even if we're wrestling with some stuff, God, would you let us leave with joy and a smile on our face and our hands lifted high saying, God, I love you. 
Because God, you loved us first. Thank you for that.